Art is what you can get away with. Uh, this is an artist from the 1960s and 70s, Andy Warhol. Some of you may have heard of him, uh, lived in New York. I was in New York this summer. Um, but I, I like that quote. I think it's, uh, it sort of adds a little bit of uh, sort of rebelness to the artistic world. Okay, so we're going to have to do a little imagination to start. So imagine an alien race lands on Earth. Okay, so this alien race, but they're friendly. They're not like attacking or anything like that. And we start showing them around our culture, the human culture of Earth. And they understand things like math and science. They go, oh yeah, I get that. We have that too, right? We flew here in a spaceship. They even study our history and they go, oh, I get it. I get your history. But then we bring them to an art gallery and they're like, well, what's this for? I don't, I don't get it. And then we take them to a concert and they're like, well, what's the point of this? Why are, the, why are you guys doing this? And then they say, well, here's a book called War and Peace. And they go, well, is this history? And you go, no. And they go, well, what's the point? They don't understand what all this stuff is. And as a result, they just go, yeah, it's useless. We don't even need it. Imagine that's the case. Imagine that all of the stuff that they would say is useless was taken out of our culture. Imagine there was no arts. Okay? Imagine there was no paintings. Imagine there was no music. Imagine there was no film. There was no literature. Imagine that was just all pulled away and everything on this planet was practical. Think about that for a second, what this world would look like. The fact is the human race has had this need to create aesthetically pleasing objects for as long as we can track, right? Entire cultures, no matter what culture we look at, no matter what age, they like to do things like sing and dance and paint and create. It's part of our nature. It seems to always been there and it seems to always continue. What would it look like if there was no such thing as the arts? I mean, you guys may, I don't know uh, what interests all you guys. Some of you might prioritize the arts in a lot of ways. You might say, you know, they, these are really important to me. And some of you might lowball prioritize those, especially last year's TOK group. They were a very science heavy group. They, you know, a lot of them wanted to go into like medicine and biology and stuff like that. And they hadn't taken what they would call any arts courses in a while. You know, it hadn't been since middle school or even elementary school that was the last time they touched like a drawing or something like that. But for a lot of us, the, the arts, without it, life would be boring. It would be nothing, okay? So in this unit, I want to consider four essential philosophical questions. We've already considered the first one. What, what is art, okay? And when we make a judgment call on art, are we doing that objectively or subjectively? And again, just to make sure you're clear on what I mean by that is, subjectively would mean what you judge as art could be different than what somebody else judges as art. And that we can all have our own judgments of what is artistic. Or are there rules? Or are there like standards to what could be considered good art? Okay. Third thing we're going to study in this unit is, how does learning the arts contribute to the overall knowledge of the world, right? Is arts just kind of a, a hobby, or is it an important study that contributes to the knowledge of the world? And then finally, we're going to compare and contrast the arts with the sciences, because they seem to be kind of diametrically opposites, but we're going to make a comparison there. Okay, now, a lot of what we're going to talk about here, when I say the arts, right away I do, and I'm sure you guys do a little bit as well, you focus on like visual arts, like painting and drawing and stuff. But that's not all that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the entire artistic sort of genre. So this can include anything from cooking to dance to all kinds of stuff. Okay, so when I say the arts, I'm talking in a very broad category. Art imitates, sorry, life imitates art more than art imitates life. Okay, so here's the essential question we studied. What is art? A tough question. What distinguish art from not art or from what may be called junk or a lot of you said that in, when you were doing the activity, like I just don't like it, it's garbage, it's whatever. Okay, it's a practical question, right? If you were in charge of a government agency that had to distribute money and you had to give money to the arts and you were going to say, oh, I'm going to fund this project. We have government money and I'm going to fund it. Right? Or I'm, I'm in charge of the school and I have to set up a timetable. Well, how important should I timetable the arts? You would probably make that judgment call as to what you consider good or art in general. Right? Do you give money as a government agency 
to a group of people who want to hang dead bunnies in a park and call it art, because there was an artist who did that, should he have gotten government money to do that? You as a government agent might have had to make that call. As principal of the school, would you give money to a teacher who wants to run a course in rap music in the school? Would you? I don't know. You might. You might not. Right? It depends on what you would call. So the fact is that question does have real world application. Okay? So you guys came up with the criterion that I think I agree with, and most people do, that one of the first things for it to be called art, that it should be man-made. Right? That you guys kind of even opened it up a little bit more. But a lot of people would say that, yeah, for it to be art, it has to be man-made. That something like a sunset is certainly beautiful, but it's not art. That there's a difference between beauty and art in that way. <coughs> so I'm going to look at these three criteria. Then you guys kind of already dissected them, which is cool. You get, already did the work for me. What are the intentions of the artists? What is the quality of the work? And what is the response of the spectator? That's the one that maybe we didn't quite look at in the, in the activity that we started with. Should a spectator have a response if it's art, right? Like when you guys look at that painted wall behind you, you may not have much of a response to it. It's just a color. It's just a wall. But if something was sort of like painted on there like a, a smiley face, it's going to maybe elicit a response from you. And is that part of art? Does it want you to look at it? Okay. Okay, and we kind of did this this morning. We did this same activity, so. Art is meant to disturb, science reassures. So does art specifically kind of shake you up a little bit when you look at it? In some ways, in a negative way, in some ways in a positive way, sometimes it makes you feel good when you look at art or you listen to a piece of music that like, might make you weep or something like that. And then other things that you look at sort of make you feel disgusted, but maybe that was the intention. So let's start with that. What are the intentions of the artist? Okay. Some would say that the artist is trying to communicate something to you, that that's their intention. They want you to get a message. And last year, when we looked at language, we knew that communication is extremely complicated. It's not a simple black and white matter to think about communication. So a sunset, like over the summer, you guys had those two months, maybe you're at the lake and you looked out and you saw this like absolutely gorgeous sunset and you thought to yourself, life can't get any better. I just feel amazing right now. But the sunset itself did not intend that to happen. It just, it just happened. You felt it, but there was no intent by the sunset to do that. So some might argue that the artist has put the intent into the piece. They intend for you, even as someone who manufactures pots and pans, they intend for you to think, what a nice pan this is, right? Okay. Some might also argue, okay, and again, I'm getting a little more controversial, and you don't certainly have to agree with this, that if it's going to be art, it shouldn't be necessarily practical. It shouldn't be made, it may be practical, it might have a practical application, but that really it was made with an artistic intent and not necessarily a practical intent. Okay, so that would then have trouble with the pots and pans, which are being made for a practical purpose. So we could say, well, and maybe that's why you guys had trouble with it, is it's not really being made artistically, it's being made just for a practical purpose, okay? So is there a special class of items out there in the world that are being created with artistic intention that we just call works of art? So again, it's getting a little bit more controversial here. You may disagree with some of what I'm putting up here, and that's okay. It's, they're put up there as uh, open-ended questions, okay? So they have it, maybe intention. They have a specific intention to communicate something to us, but Let's now criticize this. Let's criticize the intention of artists. Some might say that intent alone doesn't just make something art. You might have really worked hard on something and intended it to be art, but some wouldn't call it art. Think about it. For those of you who feel you can't draw, if I asked you right now to draw something as best you can, and then I hung it up in the front foyer of the school, and I put a checkbox, art or not art, under it, how do you think the voting might go for some of you? Well. Even though you intended it to be art, does that necessarily magically transform it into art? This is an artist named Tracy Enum, and this is her piece of artwork that hung, that, well, didn't hang, it was displayed in an art gallery, and it's called My Bed. And all it is is a messy bed with some condom packets and a vodka bottle sitting next to the bed. This is in an art gallery. 
she's an artist and created this piece of art called My Bed. Okay? Drink it in for a second. That's art. According to the art gallery that was displayed as art, according to the artist who intended it there, intended to communicate a piece, felt it was art. Now, how many of you might think your first instincts, and be honest, that's not art? Come on now. I'm sure some of you thought it. I did. I thought, well, that's not art. That's my first instinct. But then as you start to think about it, well, okay, well, maybe if she intended it to be art, maybe, but I'm still having trouble with it as art, okay? So let's continue with that. When it was first exhibited, and here's the news article, two other art students staged a semi-naked pillow fight on the bed, but, uh, two men, by the way, in their own words, to make that piece more interested and claim that what they did was a work of art called Two Naked Men Jump Onto Tracy's Bed. That was their performance piece that went with it. And by the way, the piece My Bed sold for $240,000 Canadian to an art collector. Now does it sound like art if they think, oh, wow, maybe. Now let's think about that for a minute. If you just took your messy bed that maybe you left this morning, and let's be honest, how many of you didn't make your bed this morning, um, and you just took it and put it in an art gallery right now, how many of you think you'd get 240 for it? So why did she get 240 for it? Why do you think? Why? She was already known. Interesting. So let's think about that for a second. If I asked you guys to build a chair right now, if I gave you wood and hammer stuff, and I said, here, make a chair. And then I said, let's go sell it out in the foyer today. But then I went to Mr. Memka, and I said, make a chair. Whose chair do you think would get more money? Probably Mr. Memka's as a woods teacher. He's probably got maybe a little more skill. I don't know. Maybe you guys, some of you have some great skill in that. But is there a skill factor to art? Is there, an, as, as, as Hannah put, a known factor that if you're a known artist, if you seem to have some sort of skill, that it gives you cred, it gives you credibility? Maybe that's a piece of the art. Okay, let's take another look, okay? So some say that intention isn't alone going to get it done. That necessity is neither sufficient, uh, sorry, intention is neither a necessity or a sufficient condition to qualify something as a piece of art, okay? So something that may in fact not have been originally intended as art might now be treated as art. You might think about that. Someone may have made something that we didn't think was art. Maybe a, a shipbuilder back in the 1800s, was just building it to be practically a ship. But now when we look at that ship, we're like, oh, that's beautiful. That's a piece of art. They may have not have had that intention. So again, it kind of leaves it very open-ended. Here's a piece of art. I know it's hard for you to read, but this is a Spanish artist named Cuco Suarez. And he performed in the streets of northern Spain, and he called this piece of art, News is Written in Blood. And it's just him walking the streets uh, that he had set on fire in a football helmet, a, uh, a leopard skin uh, thong, and wooden, Dutch wooden shoes with like 1970s white socks. This is his piece of art. News is written in blood. I'm sure that's the first thing you thought when you saw this picture this morning. Okay, I would love, by the way, one of the school administrators to walk in right now and wonder what the heck is going on in here. But this is a piece of art. News is written in blood. Now, I'm sure he had an intent. He is probably a recognized artist. Do you consider that art? <laughs> it's meeting the criterion. He's a recognized artist, so maybe he has a certain skill set. Maybe he's skilled as an artist. He has intention. He means to communicate something. We may not agree with it. And so, again, it kind of throws the whole art thing into a bit of a question area. The essential function of art is moral. Hmm. Is there a morality factor to this? So let's take a look now at the quality of the artwork as a, as a criterion. Okay? So, okay, should we think about skill set? Should an artist have a high level of expertise for it to be called art? Okay? This again goes back to that question about the child's painting. A lot would argue that as a child, they don't, at this point, have a lot of specific skill, that it's still in development, okay? Or let's say we put a baby in front of a piano, and they just pounded the keys, right? Versus someone who's been trained in piano for years. There, there's certainly a difference there in the terms of skill set, 
right? So is that going to have a P, uh, factor in it, right? If you put a saxophone in front of me right now, it would, I couldn't do anything with it. But I bet you some of you in here could produce music from that. So is skill a factor in this? Okay. Um, if that's the case, if training and expertise is something that can get factored into this, how do we do that? How do we kind of do that? Is it also going to kind of lay in that something about beauty? Just because someone is an expertise in a certain, say, musical instrument, doesn't mean they're necessarily going to create beautiful music from it. So is beauty a part of that? Now, if we get into sort of the traditional view of art, if I was to bring Miss Fernie in here to talk about art, she would might start talking about things like form and content of, say, the visual arts. So really specific technical things. I know a couple of you guys are, and, and maybe gals are in music, right? So if I see you to, if you were teaching music for the first time, what would be some of the important things that you'd bring out in teaching music? Rhythm, right, and pace and stuff like that. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a music guy, so I wouldn't know. But you could probably lay out a few technical criterion as to what's there. Okay, and that's that skill factor, right? Okay, this is a piece of art called the bull's head. It was made by Pablo Picasso. It's a bicycle seat and bicycle handlebars. Does it take a lot of skill to create that? Not really. It's pretty simple. Bicycle seat, bicycle handlebars. But this is a famous piece of art. In some ways, it's not the fact that it takes a lot of skill to create that. What he did was what, what a lot of us might call original. It was creative. No one had thought of doing that before. Just that, oh, that's really cool how he put that together. It wasn't that hard, what he did, but it just was created in, in a kind of a very original way. I'll draw it to the music again. In music, some might say that there is no original music, that all music is kind of a copy of other pieces of music that you've heard before. But sometimes you just hear some notes put together in a very original way and you think, ah, oh, that sounds amazing. Now it's not like you'd be thinking, well, that's actually a really easy song to play, but because they had done it for the first time, maybe that's what adds that creative factor, that sort of neat thing. Have any of you heard of the word kitsch before? Kitsch is a German word. It essentially means a knockoff. Now this would be, kitsch is a, a sort of a brand of art that's often sort of this idea like um, elevator music. You guys ever heard of elevator music? Or they used to play them in uh, department stores like Walmart and stuff. They used to play like popular songs, but they take the words out and they just sort of cheesily play these songs that are really cheesy. In the lip dub last year, they had uh, elevator music. You guys remember the lip dub when it goes up the elevator? Um, um, the video producer in the school who did that searched actually searched the elevator company of our school to find the actual elevator music that that company uses to put in the video last year. That's the kind of attention to detail in that lip dub last year. Um, or a soap opera. Soap opera, some might say, is kitschy. It's this sort of knockoff art. So some would criticize that. They'd say, well, knockoffs aren't really artistic, right? Elevator music isn't as skilled as the original, OK? But that creativity, that ability to think outside the box, a, a writer who creates a metaphor for the first time, this really incredible metaphor that you read, something really creative like that adds this kind of artistic factor to it. Art's not a copy of the real world. One of the damn things is quite enough. OK, and then the final thing I want to look at, yeah, yeah, is the response of the spectator. So you guys are looking or seeing or hearing or tasting art. What's your response? Some say that for a joke to be a joke, someone should laugh. If nobody laughs, some would argue it's not a joke. Right? Like, as of, what am I saying? Am I saying it right now? Is that a joke? Not necessarily. Maybe until you laugh, it's said it's to be a joke. So in order for a piece of art, do we need a spectator? In other words, if you drew a beautiful thing and then just tucked it away so no one ever saw it again. Is that art, right? Some would argue that for it to be art, people should see it. People should experience it. Writers want to be read. Painters want an exhibition. Choirs want an audience. Bakers want you to eat their food, right? So if that's the case, if artists want people to experience their art, who are they appealing to, 
Okay? Is it the general public? If you guys say we're to write a story, are you writing it for everybody? Or do you pick out a specific audience? Okay? Very often, people are hostile to new forms of art. You guys, rap music, for example, is a fairly new piece of music, right, in the whole sort of genre of musics. Some might even argue rock and roll is a very new piece of music, as opposed to what we would now maybe call classical music. So when a new piece of music, right, so what's some of the new music uh, genres now? Um, there's like that... Uh, like techno stuff, that, but there's like dubstep, yeah. I, I don't get it. I don't get it at all, right? And some people will be hostile to that. Does that make it not art? Or is it just the fact that the people who were making it were appealing to a certain specific there, and they weren't, they were like, they didn't care about that guys like me wouldn't get it. That's not their concern. It's possible that in about five years' time, a new piece of music will come out that you guys will be like, I don't get it. Right? Think about it. You guys would be like in your 20s, you would be like, I don't get that new stuff. That's for the kids. The kids get that. You're going to be that person one day. And you might think to yourself, oh, wait a minute. Maybe they, that, they didn't care if I got it or not. Okay? Um, the poet Shelley once wrote, uh, time reverses the judgment of the foolish crowd. Right? It's possible that years from now, people will look at rap music and call it classic rock mu or rap music. There'll be a genre of classical rap. There might be even a genre one day of classical dubstep. It's possible that over time that might happen. Did anyone see this exhibition when it came to town, the bodies, or seen it somewhere else? Yeah. Does anyone know what that is, that, that thing? Um, I, wish, uh, I wish it stayed in Winnipeg, because I, I took my TOK class the year it was here in Winnipeg. We went to it as a um, field trip. <coughs> but this is an exhibition of dead bodies that are posed. They are dead bodies. Now, does anyone know the controversy of this exhibit? That's correct. Yeah, they were Asian prisoners that died, and they claimed that they died without any family claiming the body. In other words, they were kind of like unnamed prisoners. That's what they claimed. The controversy is people would say, well... First of all, they, they couldn't confirm that. And second of all, they thought, well, is, is this morally right to even do this, to exhibit this? Now, at the same time I took my TOK class to look at this from a TOK perspective, I combined my field trip with Ms. Fernie's class, who went to look at it from an artistic perspective, and we also combined with Ms. Blankenberg's class, who went to look at it from a biological perspective. Because a lot of what you see is you see, like, through the skin, you see the bones, you see all the organs and stuff like that. So as a biology teacher, she could... She went to her class and she pointed out some of this stuff. Ms. Fernie, because a lot of them are exhibited in things like, you know, poses and stuff like that, talked about it from an artistic standpoint. And as a TOK class, we kind of looked at it from both, but then we were the first ones to challenge because the, the exhibitors came over, like the museum curators, and they were saying, oh, you're from a school, we have this thing. And I said, well, can we talk about the controversy of this? And it was actually one of my TOK students who said that, and they backed right off. Oh, no, actually, no, we got something to do. And they took off. They did not want to talk about the controversy of that. And I was just like, oh, that's too bad. My class just wanted to engage in kind of a morality debate with them, and they didn't even want to, they didn't even want to have anything to do with it. They just backed right off. Um, but it, again, has that idea of, is that the intention of the artist? I mean, there are a lot of artists who create art with the intention of shocking you. Like maybe that Spanish artist I showed you. The whole intent was to shock you, right? You may have seen bathroom wall art that's intended to shock you, right? Is that art, right? Or is there a criterion, a different place we should put that, okay? So at some point, maybe we need to appeal to a so-called expert to judge things, okay? Some others would argue there is no expert. That Miss Fernie has no right in putting a mark on a piece of art. That even though she's been through university, she's been teaching art for years, she has no right to do that. Some would argue that. Some would argue that it's just a matter of taste. What you say is good, it's not. Now, are we going to have this same discussion, do you think, when we get to our unit in math? Do you feel in the same way that Mr. Jansen Roth has no right to judge your math test? 
that if I think 2 plus 2 equals 5, I have the right to say that because it's in my taste and it's my opinion that it's correct. Many of us would have trouble arguing that. But in the arts, it seems like that is something that we can do. Or is it, right? Or are we judging things under different criterion sets here? Okay? Do you think an expert has an opinion that is more problematic in the arts more than the sciences? That's the question, right? Like, is there so-called experts in the arts? Is there, sh are chefs actually more expert at judging what tastes good than you are? It's a big question. Okay, we'll wrap there today. So, just stop my video.